The Square Ball Podcast. Welcome to the show. It's brought to you with Levi Solicitors. 10% discount on your legal fees at levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. It's the, um, it's the Bielsa goodbye show. Um, I'm Dan in the studio, just by Ellen Road. Uh, John Richardson's with us. Hello, John. Hello there. And Michael as well from his COVID bunker. Hello. We're all by ourselves today, aren't we? We are. Um, I guess we'll start with you, John, because you have been up to Thorpe Arch this morning, Monday morning. Um, so talk us through that. Um, yes, it's, it, um, it's not a decision that was supported by anyone else in my household, but I watched last night because I thought I'll just leave him, you know, I'll leave him to it. Um, and then when I saw him having pictures with people and I thought, oh, actually, it's a, it's a thing to go, isn't it? And then I found out that he was going to be saying goodbye at Thorpe Arch this morning. So I thought I will get my wife to take our daughter to school and I'll drive for an hour and a half to stand in the rain, uh, outside a training ground next to a prison. And, um... I don't know. I still don't know if that was the right decision or not. He was there. He came in his little car, um, watched him go in. They didn't stop on the way in. Car was all misty. Most managers of his stature, you would say, well, that wasn't him because that was a, a 11-year-old say at Leon. But Bielsa being Bielsa, I think that was him. And um, are you want are you want in there very long? Um, I didn't think for what for the gravity of the situation. One member of staff came out um, very angry, in tears, um, swearing a lot about what had been done to us and how he was the best manager we've ever had. Uh, I say us, there was at that point me and two other men uh, <laughs> who'd taken the day off work, stood in the rain. One of them had, I think, like a Sainsbury's bag for life with a book in it. And the other guy was just in his Mac, just waiting. It was very awkward. Um, 15 minutes and then he came out and the car didn't stop um, it got sort of halfway down the drive and he'd obviously said pull over I should do something and he, uh, his mate came out with little signed pre-signed cards and he said he's, he's too upset to come out of the car oh Christ uh, and that was that he drove off and I think that's the last time I'll, I'll probably lay eyes on him in, in the flesh which is why I went up I, I watched it last night and I thought I can't I can't have the last game I was at was against them and I can't have that be the last time I laid eyes on him a defeat at the hands of them so I thought I'd better, I'd better go up just in case I didn't I didn't know what I was expecting I didn't know if it would sort of feel like intruding on the sort of final good by but I just as I was watching last night it was unbearable to Lucy I just kept saying I should be there I should be there but if I set off now he'll already be gone um so I just thought you've got to do it it'd it come at a time when I'm well I'm 40 this year and I'm looking back on all the people that I haven't thanked properly enough in my life like I bought a signed Rick Mail on eBay because I always thought I'd get to read Rick Mail and I've bought a Gary Speed and a John Candy <laughs> and I don't want to say I overreacted but my immediate thought last night was Bielsa's going to die one day and I'm never going to have got to thank him for what he did so I wrote him a little card and uh, passed it to his driver to give to him and I think that's I think that's it I think that's what What did it say? Or, or do you not want to say? Uh, I can't remember I wrote it in Spanish it said thank you um, thank you isn't enough um, but it's all there is so thank you for and then I listed all the things that I was glad for none of it football all this sort of integrity and um, you know the strength he showed through Covid and bringing us together and making us believe that a team was more than you know whether we won some football games or not and uh, that was it it was an awful card it was one I bought ages ago I wrote him one I had it with me at the Manchester United game and that was a nice card and it got all crumpled and wet in my pocket so I didn't give it because I thought oh, well we've got the rest of the season <laughs> I'll wait until we've won a game and then I'll pass it over then and um, then it all happened so he's got a one pound Tesco it's like a picture of a typewriter with a piece of paper that says thank you coming out the top of it but you know it what that's, that's, shit that's card. It's perfect for him it's perfect he didn't expect he didn't want you to spend any more than a pound on a card no I, I took the sticker off so he, he might you know he might think it was 150 or something but it, you know I just felt like I had to do something I'm glad I went I'm glad I got to see him and um, be there it was cold and it was wet my my abiding memory is that he sort of wasn't in there long enough given that that was supposed to be the big goodbye it suggests it hasn't ended the way 
you know, I was picturing scenes in there a bit like a sort of sad version of when we went up and they were all mm. hugging and it seemed like it was probably quite a quick in and out, quite an upsetting end. Mm. And that's it has been, hasn't it? I've I've been surprised by my own reaction to this. I mean, we were talking just before we started recording, then John and I were saying like I made the mistake of putting on Take Us Home, the song on Spotify. And it takes me about 20, 25 minutes to get here. And I've listened to that from closing my front door to getting here. And I ended up crying, driving down the ring road, just thinking about it. And my, my reaction has caught me by surprise. If this genuinely feels like one of the worst things of my adult life, um, it, it does feel like a bereavement. And I don't say that lightly. Yeah, no, I agree. That was the sense there. As I said, there was, there was three of us at the time he was there and then one, one other guy arrived as he was leaving and all four were, you know, men, I'd say, were within 10 or 15 years of each other who can't quite... It, it's, I think it's a certain age of fan who has been allowed to feel that naivety you feel as a child about football. You love it unconditionally and then you find out about money and oh they all go clubbing and it's a bit grubby and oh they don't oh they're not married they just sleep with lots of girls and then sometimes as in our not so distant past they're very naughty boys um and it's all complex and it's about money and then it this has just been like four years of being childish about football again and being able to love absolutely and trust absolutely that everything was being handled properly um, and I credit not just him, but the people around him with that. You know, it's it's been a well-run time for the club and it feels like a lot has ended. It feels like that, you know, I just don't think you'll get that back again. I just, he's a real outlier in football. Maybe he isn't. And I hope the new guy coming in turns out to be that. Um, but yeah, it feels like something, something more than just a, a, the tenure of a manager has ended. We do feel more ordinary, don't we now? I mean, I, I drove past Allen Road on the way here to the studio and... I've realized I don't, I don't exactly how I feel. I just feel different. Like, it feels like something's gone, which in I guess in a very literal sense it has. Uh, it's strange. What what have you been doing for the last couple of days, Michael? Just doom scrolling, just refreshing things on Twitter, <laughs> feeling bad about myself for kind of ever saying anything bad about him. And like, even it's, just, it's like I should have been more appreciative of a four 0 defeat or reflection. <laughs> like I should have enjoyed it more. And I'm and I'm I am sad that because of these. I had COVID, so I didn't go. I am sad that I didn't get to see it, weirdly, even though, you know, a 4 no home defeat is not something you particularly want to be there for. It, I, th I feel like it, it, it came to us on the match ball, and I feel like, the, well, I think the Phil Hay story was already out, but it kind of felt like it might be yeah. the end. And you said, Dan, in the ground, you, you kind of stayed and watched him trudge off, and it was because it was kind of like, a, I think this might be... This is it. This, this might be it. And it's just, it's un, it's unprecedented. Like I've I've not seen this. Every other every sacking of the last, well, you have to go back to Grayson, I suppose, to find any kind of sadness about it. Everyone since then has been like, well, fine, good, whatever. You know, either complete indifference or people happy about it. Grayson was, he was kind of stitched up by the board, and it felt like. You know his best team, his team had been sold from under him, and but even so, things weren't working, and you could kind of get on board with it. And but before that, I guess you go back to Wilco. But I remember, I mean, I was a child at the time, but like Wilco was, he was kind of hounded out. And yeah. on reflection, I don't, I don't know if that you say about a certain age of fan. I don't know if the way we treated Wilco slightly informs how we treat Bielsa now, because I think it probably people are slightly regretful of the way they, they were to Wilkinson. Because although, not a bit like now, there are arguments to say it was the right thing to do, but there are ways to do it, aren't there? And I think I think the fact that, I mean, there were some boos at the Spurs game, but he never got, he never had to endure like chance or anything, did he, in the same way that Wilkinson did. And having what he'd built almost kind of taken apart by the fans who'd, who'd supported him. So um, it's, it's a horrible horrible mix of I think time-wise we're victims of COVID and fixture congestion that, that there's not been many times this season when we don't have midweek games or you know seven coming up I think they probably looked at a Saturday to Saturday as or was it a Sunday to Saturday as the best mm. chance to actually have a few days to let it clear and then get someone new in to have a few days to train with the players because it's been so congested you know you sort of couldn't have it and then i don't know if ta i don't know how much these things get thought about but maybe they thought let's have a sneaky away game first and then maybe we get something at leicester and it sort of makes that 
first game back against Villa, mm. you know, we've had more of a severance, whereas mm. I think with a first game back, a home game, there'd be a lot of Marcelo Bielsa chanting going on that might... I don't know. I, I, I don't know how... I, I've never lost my mind like this about a manager before, so I don't know what the prevailing mood of the majority of fans would be. I, I know there are people who were sort of ready for him to go, but, you know, looking into the eyes of the, <laughs> the other sort of sad men who were there today at Thorpe Arch... There's like there is a there's a morning, and I think because of what's going on globally as well, it it oddly matters more. You know, you when the world is like legitimately falling apart, you cling on to the few things that made you believe and that were an escape from all the all the bad stuff. And he was that, you know. And it, and it has been that throughout, hasn't it? Because we've obviously had, you know, we had a, a kind of a season and a well a season and a half, and then COVID hit, and that was. Mm. Again, that was the it was the bit of fun that you had in a week, wasn't it? Basically, of you know, sat in your house, going out for your hour of prescribed walking about the same street every day, and then all of a sudden on a Saturday you got something to look forward to. And the way I think the way he led the club and everything and during that time was important as well. In a time when it felt like, and I, not to get political, but it felt like politically we weren't being led in a strong way to have someone to be like, well, this. Just put Bielsa in charge. Put him in charge. Of, put him in charge of everything. Put him in charge of it. Put him in charge of the government, FIFA, the UN. He can just sort stuff out. I'm sure he can. And, it, and he <laughs> was, he was going out. And I remember throughout it that fear of like, don't let people touch him. Don't mm. let them go. And, and Boris was out there shaking hands as a kind of, oh, it's all right. It's going to be fine. And you know, Bielsa was doing it as a, yeah, but this fan might never get to meet the manager of Leeds again. So although they might have a virus that's going to kill me, I'm going to have a photo with them because they're walking next to me on the motorway to Thorpe Park, so I don't have a choice. There was a real, even in that, there was a sort of selflessness to what he was doing. Mm. And last night, staying at Thorpe Park till whatever it was, half seven, eight o'clock, after he's been sacked, because he knows that's people's moment to thank him. And I'm sure he would rather have just got on a plane last night just you know but mm -hmm. he wanted to say goodbye to staff and he wanted to let fans have a chance i just think it's you know it's very special i think that's what's tipped me over the edge is, is the videos that uh, came from thorpe arch last night and i think judging by the timing of them all he was still there maybe at nine ten o'clock um sometime after which speaks to the man doesn't it and i think what's what's happened with me over the weekend is i've i've, uh, I've gone into the the uh i don't know i think is it the regret stage of uh, of grief um i'm massively regretting i feel guilty that's the word i'm after guilt i feel massively guilty for getting annoyed at the football side of things because we came in here and did the match ball on saturday and i was like the football that the football side of it had fallen apart by saturday it was so clear that it was knackered and then he's gone and i we were sat in here on saturday saying something needs to change and it did but i wanted bielsa to change and i wanted him just to make the football team better because we said as well on the match ball i don't want him to be sacked but something something needs to change but the problem is uh, you knew where this was heading f like maybe several weeks ago and thought if, if we don't do something i was just willing us to get a good result for it to click into place against one of these teams and it got it just got worse and worse didn't it? and there was an air of resignation in ellen road at the weekend but seeing all those videos has flipped me over into guilt because I've been able to separate out Bielsa the man from the football and I've realised I don't care about the football anymore. <laughs> I, I care about him and I want him to be all right and I feel bad for ever feeling bad because it's no reflection on him as a person. I was just annoyed that we, we weren't doing better but it, it is only football, isn't it? And we've lost an absolutely and he's not dead, obviously. He's, he's fine, he's okay, he's going to get to go home but from our club, I mean, and from our city, that's the thing. We've, we've just lost this... Um, well, he's a figurehead, isn't he? He's a father figure. Maybe that's what it is about, you say, men of a certain age, that so many of us have latched onto him as a kind of father figure. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's not just the city either. I sort of felt it driving out of uh, Weatherby this morning. It's the pictures that get me are Morrison's and Costa and the walk into training and the, the sweets, you know, when he gets off the bus for all that. That's just, I didn't realise how important, I knew that's what made me love him, but I didn't realise like every time I drove up the A1, I was excited going past Weatherby, which is what a mad thing to have as part of the club that, oh, maybe I'm, you genuinely thought you might bump into him in the services because he's just wandered out like Alan Partridge to get some Weather's Original or something. <laughs> there was, there was something so sort of outside of football about him that that's what was amazing. And um, 
But he, he, you know, you say you wanted him to change. He was never going. No, to, and I knew and that. I think, yeah. it, it's two mutually exclusive things, isn't it? I wanted, I wanted him to just make us better and not do the things that are going to cause him harm. It was less about me. It was about him. We know, like it, it, it only ends one way with him. I was going to say one of two ways, where we either win the Premier League or it ends like this. And I, I actually, I think it was always going to be. There was always going to be a sense of implosion about it, and the, the victory is that we've had him longer than any other club. I mm. think that's such a privilege for a man like that. That, and I, I would say now at sixty-six, he probably won't go anywhere else for four years. I hope he doesn't, because the way he works, you know, he needs a break. So I think that's it. I think Leeds is, get, gets to say we're the club that he stayed at the longest, which is phenomenal. I'd like him to go back to Newell's and have a nice time. Um, maybe just oversee something there, whether it's their academy or youth development or something. The, the thing that really, you know, is his absolute strength in identifying players because he, he loves it, doesn't he? And just returning to the football side of it, you know, I said I feel guilty for the football side of it. It's because it was the escapism for so long, wasn't it? And like you say, magnified, heightened by the pandemic. But even then, going back to that first game against Stoke, I just remember being absolutely like dazzled, sat there in the sunshine thinking, this is this is like a language I've never heard spoken before. This is absolutely amazing. This is what I've always wanted Leeds to be, and it's that that, that pure, that ideal, the, the joy that he delivered through football. And I, I wanted it to last forever. I didn't want him to get found out, and I didn't want his tactics to ever be countered. It felt to me unfair that people had worked him out. It's not fair, and that's and it goes back to the whole childishness of of my reaction to this. And I appreciate it is. It just it I felt like it wasn't fair that it, that people worked out how to stop us. The level of football is was ridiculous like the you look back at i was i was obviously as everyone was watching old goal compilations and stuff so many of the goals we've scored in the bielsa would have slotted seamlessly into like the best ever league united team goals from the previous century you know that every single week there'd be moves where we it'd sweep from the from the back to the front and it all looked so incredibly effortless but also at the same time done at about 100 miles an hour and obviously after so much training but it was so good at times and, and I guess we haven't scored without, there hasn't been as much of that this season has there and that's maybe that's a warning sign that things would, were not going particularly well that we, we'd stop scoring goals like that every week but we still did score I mean it was it was amazing while it lasted wasn't it it was it, it, you can't you won't take that away I think is the thing it's um no, I'm ready to I'm I'm ready to go into that phase now where the memories are going to be phenomenal of going up, of finishing top half in our first season back. And the Euros in between I even count as a Bielsa memory of the pride I felt watching Calvin mm. play for England at Wembley in a home tournament. I don't think there's many other managers who would have got him to that point where he was player of the tournament for England as we get to the final. So even that becomes part of this heady, insane couple of years. I, re I remember it all sunny. You know, like when you remember holidays mm -hmm. and it's just always sunny because you were on holiday and it wasn't. I just remember being in the sun watching Leeds all the time. Um, and that, you know, that will last forever. But just at the moment, I picture him crying in a flat in Weatherby with his little airport That's ticket it. in his hand. I've, I've never, I have never thought about the aftermath for a football manager. And I guess it speaks to my entitlement as a fan that I want to be entertained and I want you to provide me with joy and bollocks to how you feel. Never been that bothered. I've always, you know, you feel bad for someone like Simon Grayson who you always feel an affinity to. But this cut really deep. The, th the thought mm. of him going back to, I know he's in a house now, not the flat in Weatherby, but just being in there alone last night rattling round no doubt thinking what could I have done differently or maybe I was wrong but I could never change and, and beating himself up for for it ending like this I just I hate the idea that he's unhappy and it, that made me unhappy in turn mm. I hope he isn't I, the, the one thing I didn't put in the card that I wish I had is that uh, that sense of <laughs> it's, oh, it's such a ludicrous way to talk about a football manager <laughs> I've literally <laughs> never even brushed past in a corridor but that sense of fans just wanting him to be happy and what a difference it would make to me just to see him uh, he's not on social media but if he were on Instagram I'd love him to get off the airport and just to see you know like when soldiers get home from war and their dog goes batshit yeah I would just love to see him open the doors to his ranch and just stick a big fat steak on the barbecue open a Malbec and go do you know what I'm all right, guys. I'm all right. I'm going to be all right. I had a lovely time. I'll never forget you. But to be honest, there's a local food market here, so I won't need to shop at Morrison's anymore. Um, I can get coffee beans delivered, so I don't need to stop at Costa. And it's mainly sunny. 
and that would be such a it's it's mad that we feel that guilt i think he'd like it if you were there to meet him when he got off the plane get yourself, I would on, a, like get yourself on a flight <laughs> there was a point last night when i was <laughs> do i google flights to argentina and try and cut him off at the airport or do i just drive around weatherby and Thorpe Arch trying to catch him on his way sort of between house and uh, Thorpe Arch and I, I still think I might have got the wrong one because I think he'll be in a better mood at the airport <laughs> I think I've got him at literally his lowest point think, coming yeah. out of Thorpe Arch for the last time it's funny you're talking about him about how daft it is that he's a football manager I've just glanced at um, at Twitter and seen somebody comforting an upset child about this and it's nearly set me off again I've got t- like, tears are welling up behind my eyes and it's because he transcends the football manager side of it I think I think it's because it's it's him as a human in the world, and you said it before, John. Actually, and you know, like, um, oh, sorry, Michael. It was in a world that's kind of so cynical and populist, and you see what's happening in Ukraine, and you think these people, the these people are fucking mad. Can't we all just be a bit a bit more decent to one another? And he just felt thoroughly decent and honourable and and humble. And I and do you feel like he's changed you as a person? I feel like he's changed me as a person. He's taught me to be more like humble and and I think it all goes back to like the you know the the idea of the litter picking and being grateful for the things that you have and um what it means for like your audience for example to uh, to earn money to come and watch you. It's a privilege to play football, so you should kind of respect that and I thought, do you know what? He's, he's absolutely bang on. Yeah, 100%. I I I mean as a fo- I, I, the, the what you can only call the Bamford phenomenon is what I've taken from it as a football fan of watching a coach who knows more than you bring a player that you have been very frustrated by to, you know, nearly being the top scorer in the Premier League in our first season back is such an education that you should always feel like they know more than you and you should always trust them in in what they're doing because they see it day in, day out. And we don't have it in this country in the legal system. We all, you know, we're happy to say that a sentence should be longer or shorter without having seen any of the case. And it's the case in football. And I remember it, we had so many managers where you just... You know, Steve Evans and people like that, we're like, I'm not being funny, I, I genuinely think I could pick a better 11 <laughs> than you just have. I don't know why you're getting it wrong, but that's what's gone. I, I don't want to, I don't want to get back to a phase where I have to have that. I remember games where we'd come out and you'd hear the muttering around Ellen Road and people unhappy with the result, but it would never be, this has got to change. You always get the nutters online who this person's got to go and that person's got to go and it's a conspiracy. and you know, it's happening a bit now with the, oh, it's America and it's all to do with the 49ers and they want him out and this guy in and it's all money. And I don't, you know, I don't think, I'm, I'm as biased as anyone about Bielsa, but I do think they probably felt like, given that change was inevitable and he was going to go at the end of the season, it probably was the right time to try and do something. And I, you know, I said that thing, I'm sure a few people did, of, oh, I think I'd rather go down with Bielsa than stay up with anyone else. And even I was starting to think, oh, I wonder I wonder if I meant that. Oh, like, yeah, last night I was fully prepared to get relegated. But, like, on Saturday, when I was, I was, that's why I was angry. I was thinking, like, please don't get us relegated just by sticking to the ideal. Do, do whatever you need to do to keep mm. in your job, but keep us in the Premier League. And it just, it felt like it was heading towards a situation where it was not compatible anymore um those two you know those two goals they were sort of clashing weren't they and I, and, I, and i know my my annoyance i think came from being powerless to do anything to change it yeah and i think we can all agree the worst of all worlds is to get relegated without him if if yeah. we do that to him at the end and then go down anyway that's going to be really really unpleasant to see oh is it or is it better that he's not here for the actual relegation i don't know if if is it better that is it better that he can walk away saying well i'd have kept you up and we can all we can all agree yes you would <laughs> that's <laughs> true it's it's hard isn't it to know in the i think it in a way you, you almost wanted to delay the finding out didn't you it was like well let's let if we don't if we don't sack him and until we're mathematically relegated else can keep us up and that's obviously for the best but then it yeah i guess it's where you reach the point of being like okay well now we panic and not not that i particularly want to but to defend the the owners of the club they're talking about essentially allowing a several hundred million pounds to just be set alight if they don't if they don't make the right decision on it so it's a decision i'm glad i didn't have to make because i mean we after the game down we were kind of I think we more or less reached the conclusion that it's like something needed to change and given Bielsa's refusal to, it was probably likely to be the manager. That yeah, is I think, I think it's, it's important. That I almost immediately regretted. Yeah, it's, it's, then... it's important to draw the distinction though between knowing that that was the thing that was going to change 
and, and wanting it to happen. Like mm. I just like like I said, it's it's an incompatible situation. There's no closing the circle, which is why I think people have been like angry online, and a, a few people have accused us of like wanting him out or you've been up for this. And we haven't at all. I never wanted him to leave. I always wanted him to leave like by riding off into the sunset this this summer but as we got closer and closer to it and the relegation zone has crept nearer and nearer and we're shipping more and more goals you could just see which way it was going i just i just i don't know like you said it, it was it's rooted in powerlessness i just wanted something different to happen not this and i, and I also, just feel sad that it has and truthfully what we what we say doesn't no matter does it <laughs> it, it, it doesn't no just like whether you know i know we've i know we've got like a bit of a voice in it from having a podcast or whatever but but we're idiots it has no influence on anything. I mean, by the time we actually, I think Saturday was probably the first time we sort of said he's probably going to go, isn't he? And yeah. by that point, it had already been decided. It was clearly, it was clearly already done. So yeah. they do have to be more dispassionate than us in the board. They just have to be because it, it, if we were all up there, you, you know, I, I, I don't think I'd have ever sacked Bill. So mm. I, just, I never would have. I wouldn't have been able to picture anything else. So there was a point when I knew, even when it was going well, I was like this is mad now i was starting to worry about him going when we were being successful because mm -hmm. i just thought oh this is the best it's ever going to be for me so i can never plan for the other thing because i don't think it'll be as good and that's not if you're running a club you can't ever get to a point where you think well that's probably it this is the best it'll ever be so because <laughs> then you do get into who do you sign after that because you can't have the people making the decisions coming out and say well it doesn't fucking matter now does it mm -hmm. you've had that you've had your good time you've had swansea that's it shut up now <laughs> yeah so, fans you know. in the boardroom and all that yeah and mm. obviously the you've got the the specter of ridsdale there when it comes to making bad decisions decisions as he used to put uh put it when do you think he'll talk when do you think cause i'm not going to be on edge until he i know it's not going to be an instagram post the Elsa. until he talks about yeah no, um, never he'll, he'll never talk about he'll this never if, talk. If, he's, if he takes another job someone will ask him at a press conference and he'll have to answer it because he yeah he feels an obligation to and it'll go on for about two hours probably but i don't think he'll i don't think he, he strikes me as a man to do it and i think that's actually part of the shame of the way he's left as well because you almost want that from him you want like a nice long statement or i'd like for him to think <laughs> that in you know six months a year two years he'll be back on the pitch at ellen road kind of waving at us and we can all sing his name and give him some like the last sort of dregs of celebration from that title win that we we couldn't properly celebrate at the time but it's just not going to happen is it because he's you're not going to get there where he writes it out on his iphone notes and just screen grabs it no and he's not Twitter. <laughs> and he's not and he's not going to come back and do you know a bit of corporate stuff in the east stand and chat to some sponsors and then <laughs> and then come and wave to us on the pitch is he he's it's yeah. just if he comes back it'll be to scout someone no no I've, I've, had a, I've had a thought i've had a thought and it's because you're sat there in a newell shirt we need to when, when it comes to the official opening of the new stadium because we'll stay up so therefore it'll preserve his legacy we can therefore push the button on the new stadium we get the stadium rebuilt and then we fly him over for the opening game against newell's a pre-season friendly and he comes on the pitch and we can give him the goodbye that he named the West Stand after him. I mean, let's face it. To go back to the ownership, he has made them so much fucking money. Mm. Like they are so rich as a result of him. Radrazani was floundering in the championship, pumping a, like loads of money in and failing. Well, not loads of money, but like millions had been invested, and it was going nowhere. Like there was no sign of him getting his money back. Bielsa leaves us with. You know, Calvin Phillips being worth more than the club was when when yeah true when Radrazani bought it. So the the depth of gratitude that they are, that they owe to him is is ridiculous. But I, um, I would just extend that into us as well because I mm. I I genuinely want to say I mean, he's not going to see this, but on the off chance you do, Marcelo, thank you because I fucking hated football and I'd grown to really hate Leeds United, and then he arrived and he changed that. And he's made me fall in love with football completely again. And I know that I owe all that to him. So I'm really grateful. And it's what made me sort of, I mean, apart from, quite apart from the axe falling on my job, but um, to say, we, we can't we can't miss this. And mm. it kicked us into life and, and it's given us something that we do every day. And it's because of him. And I'm really grateful for that. And that's another reason why I feel guilty for um, ever feeling annoyed about the football side of things and wanting him to yeah. change. Yeah, I, I had exactly the same thoughts for the weekend because we, I mean, a, a long time listeners will know we've been doing this for since, you know, well, the, the magazine since 2009, podcast since 2010, and it's mainly been absolutely awful. And the podcasts were kind of a bit more sporadic because truthfully, it was hard to come in and talk about it. Sometimes you were working up in Newcastle. The thing is, when Bales took over, you were still working up in Newcastle. It was, 
it was a massive pain in the ass to do it. We were recording at one in the morning sometimes to try and to try and get it done. But he made it. He made us want to do it because it was so good again, and it was actually fun. And it reminded me of being a kid and watching football again, and, and actually wanting to go because there was something good to watch, and because I enjoyed watching Leeds score goals, which for ages was kind of almost not the point of going to Leeds. It was go I was going because it was what I did on a Saturday, and out of some loyalty to it, and. It was in spite of the fact that everyone on the pitch and everyone in the boardroom was a twat and I was going anyway <laughs> to, to, to prove some strange point to myself and also it's in certain times to just go and get drunk. But he gave he gave such a new lease of life to the club that all of a sudden it was something everyone wanted to talk about. And if, if we is still in the championship now, I'm still doing a job that I was really, really fucking hating and bored of. And I'm, I'm also hating and bored with Leeds United at the same time as, as it was being bored with my job. As it was, he, he turned the whole thing um, and I'll be, you know, forever in his debt. I mean, Can I, you add to that? Uh, no. Uh, and I was just going to say, uh, yeah, on, on, a, on a personal level for me, not just the professional side, I was in a pretty dark hole. I mean, I, it was, you know, like mentally speaking, mental health. Uh, around the time of the promotion and it helped to drag me back out of it and you know I and I know it was partly down to getting promoted um, that it, it did help me find something to you know not cling on to because that's making it sound more melodramatic than it needed to but I was not in a good place um, again you know it goes back to having lost the job and then I think lockdown I just did not take well I don't think any of us did we were all like effectively caged animals we'd gone from being completely free and walking the streets and licking each other in nightclubs or whatever we did you know to not being able to even go in the supermarket or you know it just it was it was tough it was really really tough and I didn't find it easy and I know that the big shining light during that era was Bielsa and his football because it was it was idealistic and it was pure and it was something to cling on to and in many ways is his uh, his pursuit for perfection, this idealism has been his undoing in the end. And maybe it always was destined to be, like you said, John, it was always going to end up one of two ways. Like it, it, it peaks at the top of Everest with winning the Premier League somehow. Because there's a little part of you when we finish ninth, you must have gone, we can build on this. If we just get this player and this player, we could fucking do this. I mean, and it's gone this way instead. And that's football. But like I said, the, the word is transcends, isn't it? He transcended the football side of it. And it wasn't until he's now gone that I've fully realized the magnitude of that. Yeah, well, he said it a lot in press conferences. It always amazed me for a man so sure about what he thinks and who clearly considers every decision. He he see, he knew a lot and he knew what the fan mood was and he, whether he was getting it from forums or feeding it back. I know people used to cut press cuttings out for him and he would always say, I know the people want this. And, you know, the, the whole Gellhart thing was people think Gellhart is the answer because it's not working with the other guys. But that's not that's not the same thing. And I think that's that's where the whole club feels it's at now. It's like, well, what what is the next thing? You have to you you know you have to hope it's advancement. And I do think you know it's Victor Orta that managed to get us Bielsa. And if if this next guy is the one that he thinks is the one, then you've just got to hope. Well, that's that's the right decision as well. But what, you know what they have done though, John, is they've taken away their shield, and you realise now that he's going, and and just how big a personality he was. Is he was the shield for the board, as you were saying, Michael you know he's done so much for the club in terms of getting us up hmm. taking the shield away they're horribly exposed they're naked now look at Conte he's basically coming at Spurs and from day one has just moaned about needing to buy a load more players Bielsa did none of that at Leeds and never has he came in and went I've seen what Paul Heckingbottom has done and you know what there's enough here fine <laughs> get me Bamford if you want whatever he didn't even play in that first season did he particularly he was injured all the time but you know to have to have done that it's he has he has pretty much saved them i think from it because it was growing pretty restless i think around the time of of the christiansen thing worked for a little bit but then heckingbottom was a massive failure then we went to myanmar and it felt like the club was in really quite a horrible spot and then out of nowhere it was like well why don't we just employ the best human being and manager that's available and we'll see how that goes and let's just let him do it and i guess there's a danger in that and maybe that's what it's maybe it's coming home to roost to an extent now that we you know we don't have the squad depth because of the way he likes to do it or, or whatever but you know to have got us to the point he has is remarkable i think and the, the i hope i mean i know the, the club statement was fairly um fairly short but kind of 
giving him credit. I hope behind the scenes they're a lot more grateful to him than than that statement because honestly, they he's turned us from a, a failing championship club into something that you know something that the 49ers want to buy. Truthfully, you know they they kind of they they probably will take over in the summer and Rajasani gets his money, and that doesn't happen without Bielsa. So be grateful to him. Yeah, and we've given them the clearest. I mean, you couldn't. I think the fans have said clearly, here's the reward. Here's what you get as a club to own if you get the right person. Mm. If you get someone who makes us feel like football is fun and you get us something that's just ours and you play in a way that we can get behind, then uh, Gabby Agbon Law can say what he likes and it doesn't matter because you just think, oh, you don't know because you've never had this. Yeah. You've never felt what we've had. So who cares it's, been like, it's, it's been like we've been let into the world's biggest and best secret by experiencing this and that's why i'm not bothered like I, i've had this idea of doing an article uh, but i never ever sit down and write these things they just sort of swirl around in my head uh, for the, like for the website or the mag or whatever but just about gatekeepers and people like richard keys who you know laughably suggesting like sam allardyce should come in he doesn't it's because he doesn't know any other no, and, I, and that's exactly name another one <laughs> all these just because they've got a bit of profile feel like mm. they're self-appointed gatekeepers because they get the platform on talk sport or something like that but none of this last four years was for those people. So whatever they say, it can't hurt us. It doesn't matter. This was for us. It was for you. Mm. And and there's no point that if you know Agbon Lahore or someone tries to claim some credit of like, well, I said it wouldn't, I said it wouldn't work. It's like, well, yeah, but oh, every every manager gets fucking sacked, don't they? Eventually, you know, if you if you keep saying something for long enough, then yeah, you will eventually be right. You know, eventually Pep Guardiola will get sacked at Man City. It's not exactly a bold prediction. He'll. He'll have it. It'll have an off year at some point, uh, despite the fact he's you know probably got the money, so he never has to. But you know what I mean. It's 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 not a bold prediction to say that at some point something will go wrong, is it? It's um, and I think to have got as far as we have doing this, it's been um, it's been wild. Yeah, it's been wild. Um, John, thanks for coming on. I know you need to go record another podcast now, don't you? Um, I do, and it's not about this. That's all I want to talk. Good luck with that. I should say, I mean, I know you'd, you'd never insist on us plugging something that you're doing, um, but I will say, meet the Richardsons is back, isn't it? On Dave, um, is it next week? It is. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. A mate texted me and said, "Does this screw up your next series?" Because we've already filmed it. I don't think there's as explicit. And we had an episode in series two that was all about me stalking Bielsa. I don't think there's anything this clear, but there'll certainly be a lot of mentions. So. Um, Sorry for any Leeds fans that get triggered by the sight of me in a BLC t shirt in about four weeks' time. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming on. And um, Michael. Absolute pleasure. Sterling work. Fingers, fingers crossed we get a neg negative test soon. Mm, yeah, it was still very strong lines yesterday, but we'll see. <laughs> Cheers, boys. We'll speak soon. Take care. The Square Ball Podcast.